it's a pleasure to uh, in, to introduce uh, Professor Fernando Castro. Uh, Professor Fernando Castro uh, got his PhD at uh, at USP São Carlos. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, when was that again? Uh, good question. I think uh, 2007. <laughs> I think. 2007. 2007. And then he went uh, to, to Switzerland, to the EMPA Institute. And then after that, he has been at the National Physical Laboratory in England, where he has had a distinguished uh, career. And he's going to talk to us. Uh, you are not showing yet your... Have you made him presenter, Edson? I will. Yeah, oh, yes, sure. I yeah. yeah, I have I have the title here somewhere, but uh, uh, okay, yeah, there, there we go. Uh, Non-scale investigation of degradation mechanisms in triple cash uh, cation perovskite films. So thank you very much for accepting uh, the invitation, and uh, you may start. Okay, thank thank you, George, and thank you, Maleta, for for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to to present some of the, the work that we're doing. Uh, and I wanted to start by uh, putting that message here that uh, in average, when you think of a new material, it takes between 10 to 20 years from the time you discover something, doing some PhD somewhere, to eventually being commercialized. And that's a really long time if you think about that. Um, and typically, uh, one of the, the bottlenecks tends to be when you're trying to upscale the manufacturing of those materials. And very often companies call that the valley of death because that's where companies die. Uh, and for most companies, if you're thinking about, for example, a, a solar cell, they, they would like to uh, do a process to manufacture those cells and look at some measurements and say, oh, that solar cell looks a bit inhomogeneous, uh, probably it's, it's not ready to be bringing to the market. So I need to do some, uh, some development and, and get to a better process. And, and once they do that and then look at the, the images again and they say, okay, now it looks a lot more homogeneous. It's within my tolerances, I can sell it. Now the problem comes when I, I, I tell a company that actually these two images are coming from the exact same device. So it's exact the same sample. Um, it was measured immediately uh, one image after the other. And the only difference is one parameter changed in the measurement. So now the company has a big question to, to answer. Uh, can they sell the product or do they need to go back and, and improve the process and spend time and money? So being able to measure something in a reliable way is, is really very important. Uh, and not just for industry, but also from, from the university perspective. So there's a, a survey a few years ago from, from Nature where they found that 70% of the researchers uh, tried and failed to reproduce someone else's experiments. Probably some of you in the audience have read the paper and thought I'll, I'll try to reproduce this work and couldn't reproduce that work. Uh, and in some cases, some scientists didn't even uh, manage to reproduce their own results. So this really means that it slows down the progress uh, of, of your work and, and it, it, you, you you're wasting money and time for everyone. So the reason why I'm saying all this is because I, I work at the National Physical Laboratory and our focus is to develop uh, high quality measurement uh, science. So we are a national institute, we are not a university, we are not a company, uh, but we do work very closely with both companies and universities uh, across many different areas. So some of the key activities we do is to develop and disseminate uh, measurement standards. Uh, in some areas, this will be uh, linking to the international system of units, for example, with the development of what is a meter, what is a kilogram, and so on. Uh, but in other areas, and mostly the areas that I work on, uh, we're developing multidisciplinary uh, research and development for both the public and the, the private sector. And we work across uh, the different stages of innovation. Sorry? Uh, I just want to tell you, you can use your mouse as a pointer. So okay, yeah, I'll do that. You, yeah, Might be easy, easy. yes. Uh, so we work from basic research all the way to, uh, to uh, high development stages uh, in collaboration with uh, both universities and companies. So we help in 
identifying, developing new concepts uh, in testing materials, testing products, um, identifying how to measure the performance of these, how to measure the quality, and then supporting uh, industry in uh, compliance with regulations and, and standards. So myself, um, I lead a group called Electronic and Magnetic Materials. And my group has two key uh, focus of activities. On one side, we're focused on supporting the electrification of transport. As you know, most of the uh, cars, aer uh, aerospace transport and so on are becoming more and more electric. So we're developing uh, metrology for that. Um, but I'm not going to talk about this today. Uh, I'll focus on the second area of activities in my group, which is that of emerging electronic materials. Uh, and this has applications in many different areas. Um, from soft electronics, that would be materials that can be flexible or stretchable, such as um, electronic skin or smart contact lenses, to uh, 2D materials or nanomaterials, so nanoelectronics, to organic and printed electronics uh, when we're talking about um, thin films. So I'll just give you a, a very short overview of some of the activities we've developed in the past few years, just to give you an idea of some of the projects before I move into the, the, the key point of the presentation today. Uh, we did a lot of work on transparent and flexible electrodes. Uh, in these materials, typically we're very interested in understanding how the mechanical properties correlate with the electronic properties. Um, and for example, when you bend the material, so these graphs here, what they show is how the sheet resistance, so the resist electrical resistance of the surface of film changes as a function of bending cycles. And the more you bend it, you, you expect it to start to break, um, and therefore the resistance should increase. Um, and what these uh, curves are showing you is that depending how you do the measurement, you either see those uh, changes or don't see those changes. So when, when companies are trying to specify the materials that they're going to buy, they normally will look at a, a piece of paper that says what the properties are. And if those properties are measured in a different way, uh, they won't be able to compare them. And it becomes very difficult to know which material is better than, than the other material. So we feed that information then into international standards committees where, where we have a representation. But one of the perhaps more uh, exciting work we've done recently in this area is looking at um, uh, how do you integrate um, electronic sensors into smart contact lenses. So this is the work we did with uh, some international collaboration uh, with a, a number of different uh, people in the US and China, um, where they were uh, implementing 2D material-based sensors for temperature, for glucose, and for uh, light as a photo detector into a flexible contact lens, and we're investigating um, how these materials perform. Another area that we're very active on, and uh, to be mostly uh, what I will base my presentation today, is that on nanoscale characterization. Um, and that's basically focused on atomic force microscopy measurements, uh, but quite advanced mode, and I'll talk more about it uh, in a few slides. Um, but also, we are very interested in macroscopic measurements. Um, and typically, when, when we work with companies, nanoscale measurements are very interesting, but they're very slow. So they want measurements that can be done in large areas. And one of the uh, latest developments we've been doing is that of uh, compressive sampling imaging. So in this case, when you try to do an image, instead of using a single light beam, uh, you project a pattern of light onto your sample. And you might be able to see that pattern here, it's not very clear. Uh, but what you do is then you project a sequence of patterns and you measure the result of each of these patterns. And you can use that to reconstruct your image. So this is a way of encoding information into, into your beam of light and then reconstructing. And it, it gives us some very significant improvements in, in the measurement that you do. One of them is that you can significantly enhance the signal to noise. So for example, uh, here measuring some um, solar cells we can have an improvement of about a thousand times in signal to noise. And that means that you can measure larger areas, but also it means you can measure much faster because you don't need to uh, integrate for longer at each point. Another uh, activity that we're very uh, um, working a lot on is uh, multimodal characterization. As you know, uh, any advanced material typically would um, uh, you can't really explain it by just measuring one particular property. Very often you need to understand how different properties correlate. 
and we've been developing methods that allow us to uh, to measure those properties ideally at the same time or at least at the same location uh, to help better understand these materials. Uh, one example at the top here is where we do this kind of measurements in controlled environmental conditions. So this is a portable environmental chamber we developed uh, connected to a, a measurement system where we can measure both um, optical uh, images, uh, optical spectroscopy and electrical measurements all at the same time. And then we can parameterize uh, either the images uh, as has been done here, but also looking at, for example, a current voltage curve uh, and, and use a circuit model to extract parameters that then uh, is used to understand how different uh, aspects of the material is changing. In collaboration with our data science department, we're also more and more uh, looking at data fusion and how we combine data sets from different types of, of measurements as well. So if I was to uh, try to summarize um, these activities within the group, essentially on one side, we're helping to enable new technologies. And, and we do that mostly trying to understand how, how the function of the material correlates with the structure uh, all the way down to the nanoscale. So th this could be through, uh, for example, looking at molecular orientation. So this particular project here in the middle, we were uh, developing a way to uh, use Raman spectroscopy to measure uh, the molecular orientation of uh, organic uh, semiconductors inside the channel of a transistor to directly correlate that orientation with the uh, charge mobility, which gives you an idea of uh, how fast you can switch that transistor. Uh, on the other side here, we're very keen to understand performance um, and not just the performance as you create the material, but also the performance as a function of time. And some years ago, we did a lot of work on how to measure, for example, the charge mobility of organic semiconductors. Uh, and we published a paper in organic electronics that's mentioned here, uh, where we described uh, how to measure this and how to take into account where the errors are coming from. And this paper has now been, uh, I think it's been in the list of most downloaded papers since 2014, uh, because it, it really uh, explains very well how you can do the measurement and compare your results with other people. And specifically, uh, what is it that you need to fix in your device to be able to have reproducible devices? And in today's presentation, I'll essentially mix these two areas a little bit. Uh, we're interested in understanding reliability, degradation, uh, but we want to do that by looking at changes that are happening at the very local nanoscale. So essentially going back to the title of uh, my presentation, which is Nanoscale Investigation of Degradation Mechanisms in Triple Catch and Perovskite Films. Uh, the reason why we're interested in that is that perovskite films are very um, promising for solar cell applications, for energy, solar energy applications. And I'm sure uh, I don't need to convince you as to why uh, solar energy is important, but I, I really like this image here that's from, from a paper from Paris and Paris, where the, the volume of each of these um, spheres here indicates the amount of energy reserves per year that each of these technologies can provide. And here in the middle is the world energy consumption at that time. Um, and as you can see, there's plenty, plenty of energy uh, coming from the sun that can be better utilized. And, and certainly in Brazil is a place that there's, it makes absolute sense to invest heavily in solar. Um, obviously, that, that kind of argument doesn't um, convince everyone. And some people kept saying that perhaps it's too expensive, it's too complicated. Uh, but last year, the International um, Energy Agency put out a report that shows that solar energy is now the cheapest source of uh, electricity in history in most countries. And it's even cheaper than burning gas or coal in, in many countries. So solar is, is important. Um, why do we care about perovskites? Um, this is a chart that shows deficiency of uh, different solar cell technologies. And it's a very complicated chart so, uh, to, to present quickly, but in the top part of the chart here, you see the technologies that are uh, used in space. So these are very high efficiency, but very expensive. Uh, they're not used in terrestrial applications uh, uh, because of the cost. In blue, you have crystalline silicon, which is about here in the middle. Um, and this is 90% of every panel you see around the world today. 
Now, what's interesting is to see these emerging uh, PV technologies, and I'll remove the rest to, to make it easier to see. Um, perovskites came up uh, in, in this graph a few years ago, and very quickly, they achieved efficiencies very close to crystalline silicon. So they are now at 25.5%, and if you use them in a tandem structure, close to 30%. So they have very good efficiency, and that's why lots of companies and lots of uh, institutes around the world are investigating this material. And what are they? So perovskites are essentially it's a crystal structure. So uh, perhaps the most famous type of perovskites are piezoelectric materials. Um, but this is a, an organic inorganic semiconductor perovskite crystal structure. Uh, typically, it's formed of a cage of uh, lead ions. Then you have an octahedron of halide ions that could be bromide, iodide, or chloride. Uh, and then in the center, you have a, a cation that can be either organic, such as methyl ammonium, or, or inorganic, the cesium. And you can mix uh, or change the stoichiometry of this system. Uh, and by doing that, you can change the band gap. So these are different perovskites, just with different tweaks of these combinations here which makes them good to, to use as in a tandem cell configuration where you want one cell to absorb part of the light uh, wavelengths and another cell to, to absorb another part. But it's also very good for light emitting applications. So there is a lot of interest in these materials for uh, LEDs. The further advantage is that they can be solution processed. Um, and the, the, the good thing about this is that Solution process means you can use low temperature, and it means that you can deposit these films into a flexible, lightweight substrate. And there is a number of applications now that require uh, energy sources that are light uh, and portable. So, so there is a big uh, interest in there. Now, that all looks fantastic, but of course there is a, a reason why they're not uh, being sold everywhere today. And the reason is that degradation is still a very big challenge. So this is one example of how the performance, uh, so the power conversion efficiency, the efficiency of transferring light into electricity changes over time. It's from a paper from another group from Domansky, but it shows quite a, a common uh, trend that's observed where you have an initial exponential decay of performance and then a linear decay. And in perovskites, sometimes if you stop uh, operating them and store them in specific conditions, you can recover part of that loss. So the system is quite complex, but it shows that, that there is a clear change and there are changes that are reversible, uh, but others that are non-reversible. Um, and it's very important to understand that because it, you can't really start with a solar cell that works and end up with something that likes, looks like something you could put in a, perhaps in a museum close to some uh, different types of art gallery, but, but certainly not as a solar cell because the efficiency of something like uh, a degraded solar cell here will be, will be too low. And just to point out what uh, other groups have looked into, so there's a lot of groups working on perovskites at the moment, including uh, groups in Brazil. Um, they've been looking at, for example, how this ionic migration impacts stability. Uh, and you can see that through, for example, changes in photoluminescence spectra, where you have segregation and aggregation of these halides. You can see that as uh, hysteresis effects in the current voltage measurements. Um, and you can see that as degradation at the interfaces, typically a chemical degradation. Um, another uh, source of, of lack of stability is the fact that these are polycrystalline films. So you have uh, grain boundaries. And these grain boundaries uh, are an easy route for moisture and, and oxygen to penetrate. Uh, and many different groups have seen a, a higher degree of degradation at those um, grain boundaries. But what we really wanted to do is to try to, to understand these processes. Why are they happening? Under which conditions do, do degradation take place? And, and we wanted to do that at a nanoscale because typically that's where, where these things start. So for that, we, we turn into uh, techniques that we, we uh, know well or, or have been working with uh, for, for a while. And they are all based on uh, advanced modes of atomic force microscopy. Uh, for those that are not familiar with AFM, uh, you typically have a, a cantilever with a, a small probe that will be scanning your surface. And you have a, a laser on the back of that cantilever 
And as your probe goes up and down with your surface, uh, you're measuring a signal here that's trying to maintain the distance the same. And that is measured as the topography of the sample. And you can have very high uh, uh, resolution with those types of measurements. But this is a very uh, powerful platform because you can modify the tip, for example, by using a metallic probe and applying a voltage between your sample and, and your probe and measuring current through your film as well. So you have now two signals, the topography and this current that goes through your film. And if your material is photoactive, uh, you can add a laser uh, or a light source and you can uh, measure photoconductivity uh, at a nanoscale. But today, uh, a lot of the, the work I'll show you is uh, related to a slightly different mode that we call the Kelvin probe force microscopy. In this mode, we're essentially measuring the, the surface potential difference between the tip and the, the surface of the film. Uh, this is done in non-contact using still a conductive tip. And essentially, when, when you approach the surface, you feel an electrostatic force between the tip and the, and the sample. And, you, and we can apply an AC voltage and use a lock-in to, to track that uh, tip-sample uh, interaction. And, and what the system does to try to calculate or measure the surface pot potential difference is to, um, is to zero this DC voltage. So when you measure the voltage of a sample, you have the co contact potential difference of your surface plus the AC signal you applied. And what the measurement system will do is apply uh, a voltage until this term is zero. And when you do that, uh, the voltage that we're applying is equal to the voltage that we want to measure. So we know what it is and we can uh, we can see it as, as a map. And uh, in our lab, we do these experiments inside a glove box. So on the upper part here, you see a picture of uh, our system from the side. So that's the glove box where our AFM is. Uh, this is a, a spectrometer that uh, can do Raman and, and photoluminescence. Uh, the light is now being coupled from the spectrometer into this glove box. And then if we look in front of the, inside the glove box, we have our AFM head here with the sample. Uh, the light is coming from the back and then it can go uh, either to the top of the sample or to, we can also couple it to the side of the sample depending on what kind of measurements uh, we're doing. But having the glove box is, is uh, quite important for these studies because it means we can measure things in the inert atmospheres. Uh, and it means that uh, we can control which kind of um, uh, um, effects can actually impact the performance of these cells. So some years ago, we were uh, collaborating with the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, and they were studying these triple uh, cation uh, perovskite solar cells that uh, combines all these three cations I mentioned before in different um, mixtures, just with a small amount of cesium. And, and this is a, a high performing solar cell, so you have quite good efficiencies, uh, but also it's quite stable. Uh, so that's why we, we wanted to use this as sort of a state of the art type solar cells to investigate um, what, what potential degradation could happen there. And when we measure these cells as, as they arrive, we, we can see the topography, which is polycrystalline, as we said. So we see the, 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 the grain boundaries between the crystal domains. Um, and when we measure the Kelvin probe microscopy, we see a little bit of uh, uh, contrast between grain and uh, grain boundaries, uh, but not that much. What we did then was to um, essentially expose these samples to what would be the equivalent of operating it under sunlight. So we apply uh, light at the same intensity as sunlight, and we apply an electric bias uh, and using the tip, as I described before, I can measure the photocurrent that's being generated. Um, and after I do that uh, to my sample, uh, I then measure it again. And when we did that, we observed that there's some nanograins being formed. There's some very small features that start to form in the topography. And that show quite strong contrast in the surface uh, potential measurements. And that strong um, contrast there seems to indicate that that's due to some chemical composition change in those areas. So that was what we we're trying to investigate and trying to understand uh, what the mechanisms are to, to, to form those. 
So the first thing uh, we did was to look at the literature and there was some, some papers that described uh, some nanograin formation and they linked that to the formation of uh, lead iodide. In particular, this, this work here from uh, Sostak. And our uh, elemental analysis measurements also indicate uh, that this is most likely formed by this um, lead iodide formation, that it seems that we're losing halide and organic losses. These are quite volatile components of the material. And, and essentially, you break down the perovskite structure uh, leading to the decompos local decomposition and formation of these um, lead iodide species. Uh, we also wanted to rule out that uh, whatever is happening is due, could be due to temperature. So because we have light and, and current going through the film, you can have heating. Um, so we did some experiments we, where we had no, um, uh, no, no light, no uh, electrical current, but just heat. Um, and we see no real formation of these nano features uh, unless if we go to very high temperatures. But at that point, we start to see uh, a complete change of the, the phase structure because of melting and, and recrystallization. So we can rule out that the temperature was the main effect. So the next question is, okay, what, what is actually happening? Why, why are these nano uh, crystals being formed? Um, and we took advantage of the fact that uh, Within our glove box, we can separate these, uh, these behaviors. So we first looked at a situation where we apply uh, an electric bias, but have no light and we are operating under inert conditions, so no oxygen or humidity. And looking before and after the measurements, it's probably too small for you to see, I just realized now, um, you see a lot of these uh, small grains being formed. And in particular, they're not formed in any a uh, specific place, so there's no preferential nucleation site. Um, and because the only thing that we're doing here is applying uh, an electric current, uh, we think it's probably involving some charged species that's leading to, to this formation of these crystals. We then did experiments where we don't apply any electric current and we just apply light uh, in inert conditions. And again, we see formation of a lot of nanocrystals with no apparent uh, nucleation sites. And because we are not applying an electric bias, um, any changes in charged species is probably coming from a uh, change in uh, local electric fields. And finally, we did experiments where we had no electric bias and no light, uh, but, but we have uh, the system in air, so we have both oxygen and humidity. And interestingly, in this point, we can only see these um, nanograins being formed at the grain boundaries. So this seems to correlate quite well to what other people have seen, where uh, these uh, grain boundaries essentially act as, as a penetration place where oxygen and, and humidity comes in. Uh, and therefore, that degradation process starts in those, in those areas when you have uh, air present. So the next question is, uh, wh what is happening here? Why, why are we forming these uh, issues? Uh, but just before uh, moving there, uh, we saw also an interesting effect that uh, depending on the applied voltage, so similar to the first experiment here, if we apply the voltage in one direction, for example, with positive bias, um, there's no nano uh, grain formation and it only forms when the voltage is applied in, in negative bias. So that's just a comment to, to help with understanding the next slide. So to try to understand that, we, we proposed a model. And um, we start with a pristine perovskite. So before we've done anything to the perovskite, we expect the mobile ionic charges to be distributed uh, in, in neutral equilibrium. And if we apply a positive bias, we, we expect this ionic species to migrate uh, essentially towards the bottom surface uh, because they are positively charged um, and when we apply the negative bias or illumination due to um, uh, electron hole pair formation uh, we expect this uh, ionic species to migrate to the upper side of the film and when they reach the upper side of the film because they are highly volatile they can escape and and and, and break down the structure and form this um, iodide uh, lead iodide grains. So that's our uh, assumption. Um, and then we thought to ourselves, it would be really great if we could actually see the dynamics of that happening. Um, 
and see this ionic migration. So unfortunately, the uh, conventional um, Kelvin probe microscopy is it just doesn't have enough time resolution to, to do this measurement. And uh, essentially, the resolution is limited by the PID, which is trying to adjust this voltage to, to zero this term here. And, and the speed that it does that is, is limited to milliseconds in our system. So if we were to look at curve of the signal as a function of time in, a, in, a, in one point, you'd see that if we turn the light on, uh, you'd have some sort of response. And then you turn the light off and there is a decay. Uh, but really with conventional SKPM, we can only probe uh, after some sort of uh, equilibrium, both uh, in the dark or under light. So we wouldn't be able to see any of these fast processes here. So in order to try to see those faster processes, uh, we turn into um, a method that is called, is essentially a pump probe, uh, Kelvin probe microscopy. So pump probes is a very common uh, type of experiment in, in optical spectroscopy. Um, uh, and we're using a very similar approach here for, for scanning probe. So essentially we use a, an excitation laser as the pump. So that's generating a pulse of light that's exciting our sample. That excitation leads to a photovoltage response from the sample with some shape in blue. Um, and then we apply a, a probe signal to, to the AFM probe uh, with this uh, waveform generator. And, and in order to, to gain a high resolution here, what you have to do is to use a probe that's very narrow in time. So it's typically, for example, a one hertz probe. Uh, and then we have to detune it versus the, the pump so that we, we measure it at different time delays versus the, the pump. So perhaps here it's a, it's a bit clearer what I mean. So this image here shows a, a typical trace from one of these pump probe experiments. So you start uh, measuring and then you have the light pulse coming in and turn the light pulse off and your signal decays. Um, and if we shift that uh, the the point at which this uh, probe is being done, we're essentially looking at different parts of these, this curve here. So for example, in, in letter B, we're measuring just after the pulse of light turned off. And in letter C, we're measuring um, at the, the pulse of light. And interestingly, if we make the, the difference between these two light and dark measurements, we see that um, the time decay of of these features is not the same everywhere. Uh, and there's actually a, a higher contrast at the grain boundaries, which indicates a, a, a different uh, charge dynamics at the, at the grain boundaries. Now, the fact that we can uh, play around with the time constants here means that we can um, look at different stages of this process. Um, and I'll, I'll be very quick with this uh, slide here. It, it's, it's a, there's a lot of data that, that uh, had to be taken to actually try to, to come up with this slide. But if you want to know more, you, it's all described in this paper here. But essentially by probing these different parts of this transient response that I mentioned before, we can uh, assign uh, different mechanisms for each part. So first an electron pair, um, electron hole pair generation. Um, then here you have a quick re rearrangement of some of the highlight uh, that is transporting. Uh, that's then um, moves into an ionic charge accumulation phase. You have a very fast electronic relaxation and then a combined both electronic and ionic charge uh, relaxation. But one of the things that uh, we found uh, doing these experiments is that um, there is um, a clear band bending uh, from the, the center of the grain towards the grain boundaries, which indicates that there is diffusion of charge from the grains, uh, uh, the middle of the grains towards the grain boundaries, which leads to, to these different dynamics at the grain boundaries. Um, our collaborators did some devices, some, some complete solar cells, where they showed that by adding some layers on top of these uh, structures, they could uh, have higher efficiencies. And indeed, when we compared um, the measurements without the layers with the measurements with the layers, we can see a very different behavior in the dynamics where we essentially get rid of this ionic uh, motion. So, so this really indicates that this ionic motion is, is directly correlating with uh, the performance and then the long-term uh, uh, degradation. Now, one, one difficulty we had here is that 
uh, we couldn't really measure the complete device because we wouldn't have um, access for the tip to, to access the, the, the regions of interest. So one thing that we would love to do, and it's something that we're starting to do at the moment, so it's still work in progress, is um, try to see if we can use optical spectroscopy to understand this energetic at the surface. Uh, and obviously, uh, traditional optical spectroscopy doesn't have the lateral resolution required uh, because the grain boundaries would be too small, uh, even with a confocal microscope. Uh, but you can use what's called tip-enhanced optical spectroscopy. Um, and that allows you to achieve photoluminescence or Raman measurements down to uh, lateral resolutions of the order 20 nanometers. Uh, the way that this experiment works is using the same setup I showed before. Uh, so it's a combination of a, a light source and uh, an atomic force microscope with a metallic tip. And what you do is to excite a surface plasma resonance at the very apex of this uh, AFM probe. And when you do that, you, you significantly enhance the, mag the electromagnetic field at that location and only below that tip. So that's, that's how you gain this lateral resolution. Um, and because the, the intensity is much higher, you also enhance your signal. So we started to apply that to perovskites, um, and we, we had some initial results uh, we were very excited about. Um, uh, so here is uh, tip-enhanced photoluminescence of these perovskites that's measured here in topography. And we can even look at specific points and look at the spectrum in those areas and, and separate um, the different aspects of the spectrum there. And what we found is that mostly at, at positions of the grain boundaries, there is a higher proportion of the longer wavelength, which would sort of uh, indicate that there is a, a change in band gap at the grain boundaries, and, and which correlates to what we've seen with the electrical data as well. Uh, of course, there's a lot more work need to be done here. One of the issues is because the intensity is so much higher, uh, it tends to degrade the, this perovskite. So it's, it's very challenging to measure without degrading the, the perovskite, even in, in complete nitrogen. So hopefully I gave you a, a sort of an overview that um, understanding this structure function relationship at the nanoscale can be really important to, to correlate with macroscopic performance. And that some of these advanced modes of atomic force microbes Microscopy can offer uh, different ways to look at chemical information, functional properties, and structural properties simultaneously in such a way that you can um, better correlate these structure function properties. Uh, most of the results I showed was with uh, scanning Kelvin probe, uh, pump probe, um, electrical modes, and uh, one quick result on tip enhanced um, uh, optical spectroscopy but our group also does a lot of work on conductive and photoconductive um, AFM. Um, and hopefully I show that uh, we're able to identify these early stages of degradation. And in our proposed model, these uh, organic cations accumulate at the surface grain boundaries, uh, eventually uh, escaping, uh, essentially evaporating some of these elements and resulting in this uh, nanograin formation. Uh, which seems to indicate that this, the inhomogeneity of the surface energy, that's the main driver for, for this nanograin formation. So if you can uh, fix that problem and, and, for example, some passivation layers might be used to do that, as, as shown by some of our collaborators, uh, then you can significantly uh, enhance the lifetime of these solar cells. So before I finish, I just want to acknowledge uh, a bunch of people that contributed, and particularly Philippe Richmeyer, who is, he was a PhD uh, student in my group and is now part of my group, uh, did most of the, the AFM data that I showed here today, together with David um, Todd from Johannes Kepler University and Keysight Technologies, um, and our collaborators at Keysight and, and Surrey, and of course, funding from European projects and from the UK government. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Happy to take any questions. Yeah, sure. Very, very uh, impressive techniques. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, now we are open to questions. Anyone wants to question? If not, uh, I have uh, I have to uh, add some. Wanna ask a question? No, you first. Go first. Yeah, I have I have two questions. One one of them and this. 
only shows my ignorance about uh, solar cells. Uh, why, why polycrystals? Do they have to be made with polycrystals or these uh, compounds only grow as polycrystals? You cannot grow, grow single crystals. Um, so ideally, single crystals would be better. So if you look at um, silicon, for example, crystalline silicon is is 90% of the market. Uh, you have multicrystalline, you have amorphous silicon solar cells, but they are, they are, no one uses them, but there's way too many defects and it's difficult to get rid of them. So for the perovskites, a lot of people try to do uh, large uh, grains or, or even fully single grains or, or uh, fully crystalline, but it's very difficult to control the growth. So they end up being polycrystalline. Okay, okay. So it's uh, it's not that for the efficiency it has to be polycrystal. It's just that you cannot grow uh, large single crystals. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. For for most solar cells, ideally you want them to be uh, crystalline rather than polycrystalline. They, they tend okay. to work better. Okay, and then just a curiosity. A uh, long, long time ago, I was asked to review a paper where uh, they were analyzing a strongly correlated system as a, as a solar cell. Uh, it was some ladder system, is, uh, as I had done quite a bit of work in ladder systems, they asked me to review this paper. I didn't know much about uh, uh, measuring efficiency and everything, but I was curious if this is, a, is something that is uh, being considered right now as a possibility using strongly correlated systems for uh, as, as solar cells, if you know anything about that. Um, I, I'm not too familiar with this example, but there, there are, um... There's quite a wide number of materials that have been uh, investigated as uh, solar cells. Uh, there are these castorite materials, which is probably the ones that you've been referring to because they're a combination of different elements and they can be quite a, a complex system. Um, but uh, th there is quite a number of different ones. I'm not familiar with, with this particular one. Uh, in terms okay. of the f efficiency, though, there is something interesting uh, that uh, because crystalline silicon was the first cells to be in the market uh, for terrestrial applications, all the measurements, uh, the, the, the international standard measurements and what people sell and so on, it's, it's done at room temperature. So they don't take into account that under the sun, these things get hot. Um, and, and the reason for that is because crystalline silicon loses performance. And mm -hmm. some new technologies, they show that they can actually improve performance when they're hot. So they might be better for countries like Brazil, for example. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, um, you want to ask something, Edson? I, yeah, yes. Everyone. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Marleta. You first. Okay. I can be the last uh, one. First, uh, I would like to thank Fernando to accept the the participation of this seminar in, uh, in our uh, in our uh, program. And Fernando, I know that you work with organic electronics, right? And now <laughs> you are working with uh, inorganic electronics. And uh, could you talk about the the future of organic electronics in comparison of the inorganic electronics? Uh, um, the future, no? the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, yes. I, uh, as you know, so uh, <laughs> for the, for those who don't know, my first uh, lab work, I was. Uh, 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 undergraduate student doing um, working with Marletta on his when he was doing his PhD so I was the machine that was doing layer by layer films for for his <laughs> his work because we we didn't have a machine yes. to do it um, so yes uh, I've I've as you know we yes I've done a lot of work on organic electronics we still have interest in organic electronics I think there are some areas where uh, the interest has moved on to other areas um, so uh, but but I think there are some some new aspects that I think will be very very important, and one of them is what I call bioelectronics. So it's the integration of electronics with biological materials, mm -hmm. um, and there organic electronics have a very distinct advantage. 
One of them is that they typically are uh, biocompatible because they're typically carbon. Uh, and the other one is because they're highly flexible. And, and I don't think inorganic systems can really compete in this area very well. Uh, uh, and I've seen a lot of new work in this area now that uh, even with companies coming to talk to us, we had uh, uh, some, some projects with companies that are very interested in how to do that. So I think this is really an area that uh, organic electronics will have a very significant impact in the future. And it's, it's still quite open because, I mean, working with biology and, and physics and chemistry is quite complicated. Um, I have at the moment a PhD student who is a biologist starting mm -hmm. some work on bioelectronics and just to, to find the right language to speak to each other is very difficult <laughs> um and yeah so um, yeah it, but i think i think this is an area that would be quite uh, quite interesting in the future okay um Edson, we want to ask a question yes um it's kind of a naive question but first i would like to thank you for a very nice talk very clear. I, I am not very familiar with the technique and the, and the materials, but I, I could try to grasp the ideas. But um, I think I, it was, I missed it at some point what was exactly the mechanism that promotes, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so the mechanism that uh, 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 how to say creates these uh, grains on on the surface yeah. are charge migration, right? Yes, mostly yes. Uh huh. So see. so for how long does these uh, do these charge um, remain on the surface if you leave it there? So if you if you wait a long time, like some uh, controlled temperature, so how long they stay there on the yeah, so so the uh, the reason for this charge migration is that you have both uh, electrons and ions in this system so for example when you shine um, lights and, and create some charges or when you apply uh, a negative uh, bias here these ionic charges they try to compensate to these these additional electric field and they compensate by moving for example, in this case, upwards, right? So why do you have those stimulus there? Uh, these, these ionic uh, species will stay close to the surface. So under operation, when they have both light and uh, an electric current going through, uh, they will be there. And that's why it's so important for the operation because it will just be constantly there until you take away the light or the, the electric bias. Um, and because they are at the surface for, for uh, enough time uh, then they have this this and because they're quite volatile small components they can easily uh, escape out of the surface so uh, an additional effect is that when when they get to the charges here we saw that there is a bend bending close to the uh, interfaces so sometimes what happens is that they start moving this direction and then the, the electrons tend to to move a bit more towards the um, uh, the, the grain boundary. So there is a disbalance between the surface and the subsurface, which is an additional electrical force to, to try to break these uh, uh, cationic from, from the species where they are. So, is that, so then when, that yeah, yes. Yeah, but the, so then you, when you remove the uh, current and the light and leave it there for a while, the system will regenerate eventually, right? Yes, yes, they'll try to regenerate. Of course, if they lost some ions, then it will not fully regenerate, uh -huh. right? But but they will regenerate. And that's what we see um, in this type of experiments here, where if you turn the light on, you have some transient behavior. And then when you turn the light off, they slowly go back. But as mm -hmm. you can see, the time constants are very different, okay. right? So so the return so, can so, be quite quite long. So in this sense, this is bad for, for a solar cell because, because it would, it would uh this would mess up with, with your your exactly uh, device, exactly right yeah but now mm -hmm. uh, i mean what we were measuring there was uh not the complete cell so uh what can be done then is to uh, include this it's almost like a passivation layer so if you think about the semiconductors in general so you can add another layer 
of another material on top of this um, uh, perovskite. And, and depending on the choice of material you use and the thickness and, and, and so on, you can actually remove those transient mm. behaviors. So you can essentially eliminate that uh, driver for, 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 for the movement. And, and we believe the reason for that is because we are homogenizing the surface energy. So, so even though there is a local inhomogeneity very easily, uh, because these layers can be quite conductive, they, they very easily homogenize that, that, um, that charge there. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, you probably have explained it during the talk, but I kind of missed it. No, it's a, yeah. I must say, when we were doing it uh, to write the paper, it took us a long time to, <laughs> to understand this. So it's it's not a, uh, it's a very complicated system. I have I have a question. Uh, once once there is this, this degradation, there is nothing that you can do to reset the material. Uh, not this type of degradation, because this is really um, literally it's volatile components coming out of the surface. So you, so you break no the, the it, it's there's no recovery. So this is part of the, the, the degradation that's really not recoverable. Okay. Um, people have seen uh, that in some cases they can see some recovery just by taking the sample back to uh, outside the light and so on. But it's certainly not because of that process. So it's some other process that we don't know what it is that, that is causing that change. And it, I, my, my guess is that this rearrangement of the uh, ionic charges inside create this uh, electric, local electric fields that decrease the overall performance anyway. So, so there are some groups now, for example, in Oxford, that they are cr trying to create uh, a 2D version of these um, perovskite layers. Um, and they have much better mm -hmm. properties, so you avoid a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. well, let me see here if any of the students uh, wrote any questions. Uh, any other questions, anyone? Uh, Marmeta, Edson, no? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, 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 so, uh, it, it, uh, keeping uh, on my uh, brain uh, process, so, so, so if you if you change the temperature, these uh, degradation will happen more faster, I would say, and yeah. and the regeneration will be faster too. Uh, this is, I think, this is what I can figure out from my reasoning. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we expect that. We haven't really done many experiments there, but but. Most observations is that yes, because you, you'd have an activation energy and, and therefore temperature would, would accelerate. Okay. So this is detrimental. It's good on one side, but bad in the other side. So yeah. at the av yeah. average, averaging out is <laughs> again nothing, right? Yeah, but I think in, term, in terms of the uh, performance and, and the issue with this, any new systems for, for solar cells is that um, because they're so complex, you have all this combination of different elements inside. Um, eventually, someone finds a small combination that actually becomes stable. Uh, and and we heard from some um, companies. So there is a company called Oxford Photovoltaics, which was one of the pioneers in this uh, in this technology. Um, and they show data that that they can put these cells outdoors for a long time and they survive. So they must be doing something that works, but of course they don't tell you <laughs> what it is. And if you, if you knew, if you if you knew that, you would not tell us too, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, to to be honest, we we had a project with them uh, to look at degradation and how we could help them understand the degradation process, and still they they didn't want to tell us. Uh -huh. so they wanted us to help, but they wouldn't tell what the problem was. So we had to <laughs> to it, it find out the problem. And, and and come up with some solution that perhaps was useful or not for them. And yeah, good, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I am seeing here that uh, there are no questions from the students. Sometimes the students write their uh, questions. So if there are no uh, no other question, I would like to thank uh, our, I our speaker the, again, the last uh, Marleta. 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 The last Why? one, okay. Yep. Yeah. It, uh, uh, Fernando, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, just one. 
Uh, Fernando, is the nano spectroscopy the future of the materials characterization? I I will understand in your presentation this. Um, it's a difficult thing to answer, Mal. It's such a difficult technique. Yes. I would love to say yes, uh, but it's a very difficult technique. It's a, it's uh, you need a lot of time of someone in a dedicated system to get it to work. Um, I, I think it can, I think especially the photoluminescence at the at the nanoscale is really powerful mm -hmm. because the signals are so much stronger. The, the Raman, we did a lot of work initially on Raman, but the signals are very low and you have some other facts that are difficult to, to separate and so on. But, but with the photoluminescence, I think it's it, it really opens up some new ways of looking at the material that could, you could not do otherwise. Um, Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, yes, but I think you need to combine that with other things. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I uh, I have a, a, a final final question. No, no one wants to ask anything. It's not related to just to your talk directly. Uh, do you? Uh, how do you see uh, opportunities for uh, for uh, PhD students from Brazil in your lab? Are there opportunities? Are there ways of for them to get there? Some uh, uh, for a short period of time, just to get uh, acquainted with the techniques and things like that. Uh, yeah, we so we collaborate with a lot of universities. Um, we don't have uh, scholarships ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, uh, we collaborate with universities uh, through that. So, um, but but so so finding the the scholarship for the funding of the PhD tends to be the difficult part. Uh, so unfortunately, that's not, that's, <laughs> not the best that's, answer. Let's say, yeah. but. But of course, uh, having placement for specific parts of projects, we do that very often, and and they tend to to work very well. So okay. uh, a, a lot a lot of these people that come and stay a while end up writing a nice paper and so on. So yeah, okay. if if anyone is interested and have some ideas, feel free to get in touch. I will pass pass along the uh, information, the, your contact information. And I I will ask you, I will send you an email today or tomorrow asking for the slides, if you don't mind. We would like to advertise yeah. the, together with the uh, the video. So okay. if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I might, I might just uh, delete some uh, not unpublished data, but it's fine. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, so any more questions, any? comments oh no, if no let's uh, thank fernando again thank you very much very nice talk very impressive uh, techniques and uh, i hope that you can uh, talk to us uh, again next year thank you very much it's been a pleasure okay. hopefully okay. we can keep in touch thank you fernando. okay thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you all for showing up I'm going to send the, if 